You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to provide you with education and inspiration. Do you want to attract more of your ideal clients and book more weddings? Well, today's episode is sponsored by Book More Weddings Summit, and I bet every sponsor exhaustively and totally endorsed this conference, which is free if you mention my name. The Book More Wedding Summit is happening August 22nd to August 26th, and in a little while, I'll tell you more about it. In the meantime, you can go ahead now and sign up for your free ticket by typing in bookmoreweddingssummit.com forward slash Andy. That's bookmoreweddingssummit.com forward slash Andy. If you missed last week's episode, it was with Jeannie Young-Savage, president and planner and designer of Details, Details, Weddings and Events. You don't want to miss that conversation. And today's guest has been on the show several times, and that is Carrie Goldberg. Carrie is the founder and creative director of CLG Creative, a fashion styling and creative consulting firm catering to personal and corporate clients worldwide. Throughout her work, Carrie channels her multifaceted background in editing, art direction, and creative direction from her experience as the weddings and travel director at Harper's Bazaar, and prior to that, as the senior fashion editor at Martha Stewart Weddings. CLG Creative's body of work is further elevated by a top-level team of stylists whose experience spans the worlds of fashion, haute couture, menswear, accessories, fine jewelry, beauty, interior design, e-commerce, travel, and more. So enjoy this conversation with Carrie Goldberg. Hey, Carrie, good to have you back on the show again. And I think you did. Didn't you just come back from Hot Couture? Am I saying that right? In Paris? From Hot Couture, yes. I was just in Paris for um, for a week. For a week. God, can you tell me something about that? Yeah. I mean, we just finished a really amazing um, but jam-packed spring season um, of weddings. And a lot of our clients more and more are interested in making gowns from scratch at the highest level, which is what Okator is all about. It's it's an exclusive piece custom made to the body. Um, there are only a select few made. There are only a select few houses that qualify to be a part of the week. Um, it's big houses like, you know, like Dior, Valentino, Chanel, etc. cetera. Um, and the more we see, the more we can share with our clients. So it was just us sort of seeing the new techniques, the new silhouettes, what's next. And we saw some really beautiful pieces that I hope We'll be able to work with for 2023 and 2024 weddings. Yeah, and and also not to mention that you're in Paris. Yeah, that too. <laughs> while you're doing this, <laughs> that too. My God, yeah, that is like it's such a there's just such a romantic vibe just walking the streets of Paris, isn't it? It's amazing. No, it's great. And actually, Stephanie, who's um, my right hand on my team and and one of my oldest friends, um, I'm lucky to get to work with one of my best friends. She and I met pretty much studying abroad in Paris. So it's fun to be back there together because we have so many memories of like being kids there and having big dreams of working in fashion. So to get to go to the shows there together, is really special. Oh, amazing. Well, you know, one thing that grabbed my attention um, about you was I, of course, I follow you on Instagram and I think it was early June, you had a post that said, and it's a paragraph here, but I really want to kind of restate it because it really, it sure grabbed my attention. And um, you said, 2021 was the most challenging, exciting, scary, and rewarding year of my life. I learned about respect, collaboration, love, fear, and grief in ways I never thought possible. I got to work on incredible projects with amazing people. I experienced beauty, success, loss, friendship, travel, dedication, isolation, and learn how much I have to be very, very grateful for. Woo, Carrie, that like we could spend hours probably talking about this, but can like can you tell me a little bit more about what was behind all of this? Sure. Um, I think I did that post for my birthday. At the time, I had just had a group of friends surprise me with the most incredible birthday in Napa. I had just finished a wedding with Michelle Rago and Rishi um, and Greg Fink and my team. And it was it just was this like incredible wash of gratitude. Last year, I had, you know, some of my highest highs and my lowest lows. I, I lost two grandparents, including my grandfather, who is my world and an inspiration Aww. to me. And 
very few people know this and I'm completely fine, but I had a, a very, very scary health moment in 2021. I had a stroke after having COVID. So, um, and recovering from that as well as I did at, in, you know, plus all of the like professional transitions and just being able to like do what I love every day. I just was this like incredible wash of gratitude and I felt that I needed to acknowledge it and, and own it. Wow. You know, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you had a stroke. And I, I'm just thinking, yeah, I'm just thinking like in my own life, these massive challenges that I've been through, I just learn so much from those. And, you know, and during the experience of it, I'm like, oh, this is absolutely miserable and awful. And then when I look back on it, I'm thinking, you know what, uh, not necessarily, you know, thank you that it happened, but thank you for what I was able to learn getting through it, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I, was reluctant to talk about it for a very long time only because I never wanted anyone to think that I lacked the capability to do my job or that I, you know, was in any way hindered. Um, I think now I speak about it more in, in a precautionary sense. Um, I think that, you know, young people, especially young women, like we don't think enough about the various health concerns that we could face. And it was a complete surprise to me. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm, completely fine. I'm feel, I feel better than I have, you know, I feel at at my healthiest. So it's definitely been a great lesson and like gratitude and an appreciation of the day to day. Cause I definitely took way more of that for granted before. Oh God. I totally can resonate with what you're saying. I mean, that was what, you know, touched me. I mean, there were a lot of things in your, in your statement there that touched me, but especially the end when you said, you know, how much I have to be very, very grateful for. And, you know, and that has been a struggle for me most of my life. And I, you know, I, 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 like I'll get, I'll reach some kind of a dream. I'll enjoy it for about two minutes. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, what's next? You know, something like that. And, or, or I, I would always have the glass half empty, you know, thinking about what it is I don't have. And I've really shifted in the past couple of years. And so, you know, when you talk about, you said it twice, very, very grateful for, I mean, that to me is, is what it's all about, really. Don't you agree? I mean, it's that's what it's about. No, definitely. I mean, I think there's so much going on in the world and in our country, and we've we've gone through so much um, over the past few years, just like as an as an overall global population, that to to not think that we are beyond lucky um, to live the lives that we do is just short sighted. I mean, and the more we appreciate it, I think the better off we all are. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I also have something else I can resonate with too, is that, um, of course, you know, you were working, uh, for Harper's Bazaar for, for a while. And I had worked for IBM and Lexmark for a while. And, you know, to, to make that shift into working for yourself, that is also another huge mountain to climb and get over and so here you are now, you know, with with your own company, CLG Creative. And so I would love to hear all about, you know, what you're doing now. I, I believe you went full time in January. Is that right? That's when you made the full transition? Yeah, in the new year. I believe you've expanded uh, to something like five or more, you know, people, you know, freelancers who work for you. And can you tell me about that, what you've built here and, and uh, where you're at? I mean, I was really lucky in that I didn't do this really drastic transition. CLG Creative is a company I've had for over a decade. It started as a personal styling business that I I started right outside of college because I was assisting a celebrity stylist and was taking on small jobs for myself. Um, and after starting the company, I got hired at Martha Stewart Weddings to be the fashion editor there. And then sort of took on small projects as a side hustle, as we all do. And that continued through my time at Bazaar. So I think that obviously it probably looks like this incredible like switch, whereas it really has been a slow roll for a long time and this slow evolution. Um, now, obviously, the company is bigger than it's ever been because it needed to be something that I gave my full time attention to. We We are a small team, but there's it's not just me. Um, I have Stephanie Alexandris, who's based in New York. She's our principal women's wear stylist. She's basically my the other side of my brain and everything that I do. Um, Mackenzie, who's our studio manager, she keeps us all on point. She takes on new inqui- inquiries. She manages 
all of the client relations and all of the client and, and just general planner communication. I have a team of two mentor stylists, Victor and Suri. I have two amazingly talented stylists based in LA and in San Francisco, Claire and Tennille. Um, and then we have producers, Jack and Muzam, that we call on for weddings and for photo shoots. So it's a little bit more of a creative consulting firm, if you will, with a specialty in luxury weddings and personal styling. Yeah. And first of all, you know, for people listening, I want to make the point that this is not like some, you know, quick overnight success, <laughs> like it looks like on the surface. I mean, like you said, you've been, you know, really building up to this and and it's taken a lot of, I'm sure, sweat and tears and, and work and, you know, to get there. What What is the biggest challenge that you run into at this point running your own small business like this? And when I say small, it sounds a lot bigger than small. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, but Tell me about that. I mean, I think that it's just going at a steady pace. It's really, really tempting to expand really fast and to do things like have an office space and have a team of assistants helping all of us. Um, None of that is something that I currently have in place. We all work remotely. Um, We have like an internal joke. Um, hashtag no assistance because everyone that works on the team is senior enough to be client facing, senior enough to solve a problem, senior enough to pick up the slack of of somebody that might need help and to anticipate that in a delicate way. And I think that all of that kind of parlays into the elevated degree of not only styling and curation and creativity that we bring to the table for our clients, but also in the level of customer service that we strive for. How do you feel about the kind of balance between the creative aspect of what you do, which is why you got into this to style versus having to set up and run the business aspect of it? That one was a bit of a challenge for me at the beginning. I started thinking that I would hire someone to manage all of the business, admin, logistics, financial, because that wasn't my thing, right? I was I was very adamant that I wanted to be the artist or the create the creator and I wanted which and I wanted somebody else to handle all of the stuff that was, you know, quote unquote not fun. It doesn't really work. Uh, clients, especially high net worth clients want the name on the door to be talking to them about money. They want the person whose name is on the door pitching them the business and there to answer questions. And so I've I've taken a different approach to it. It is creative for me. Um, the business strategy component is as creative as putting together a look. Where the business is going and how it's growing is as exciting to me as it's in a very different way, but it's, it's as exciting as, you know, being on a wedding and seeing it all come together. And then things like, you know, going to Okator, designing a gown with a house like Dior, who I've, you know, looked at my whole life and only dreamed to work with. You know, that's the icing on the cake that I actually love what I do, in addition to all of the back end of things. But I also have an incredible team. I hired a business manager really quickly. I hired a lawyer only recently just to keep my ducks in a row because I can't. I can't take it all on. It's not my expertise, but I definitely enjoy that component of it as well. Yeah. See, I love how you're framing this. Oh, you know, you're making me think back to, I mean, I I know, you know, you know, Brian Raffinelli and David Stark, you know, both planner designers, really high end. And I remember um, having kind of talking about a similar topic uh, with each of them. And I remember Brian saying that he actually loves the business as much as he loves the creative. And then David Stark saying that for him, putting together the business structure was in of itself a creative act, like like you're basically saying, that there's the creativity of dealing with the business. And I think framing it that way, having that perspective, like, you know, like you're saying you enjoy it, makes it more enjoyable and allows us to take it to a whole nother level. Completely. And it's it's funny that you should mention them because both, you know, Brian and his president, Deborah and David, and my conversations with them have helped me reframe the notion that business isn't creative. I mean, business strategy and marketing is inherently creative. It's also far closer to what I went to school for. So actually being able to put those lessons into action is is really rewarding. Yeah. 
Since you're listening to this podcast, it's obvious that you want to find new ways to improve your wedding business. And that's why I'm so excited to tell you about the Book More Wedding Summit. During this online conference, which is free if you mention my name, you'll learn how to more easily book more weddings by hearing from over 20 industry experts, including my past podcast guests, Heidi Thompson, host of this event, and Julie Novak, CEO of Party Slate, along with more. Attract your dream clients, stand out from the competition, and make more money without working more hours, and sign up for this online conference August 22nd to the 26th, which again is free if you mention my name. Register for this free ticket at bookmoreweddingssummit.com forward slash Andy. That's bookmoreweddingssummit.com forward slash Andy. Well, let's dig into the creative here uh, part of it. So, you know, in terms of the styling process, you know, I would love to hear how you view that. What What is your process for styling? Sure. So we like to say that we don't have a cut and dry process. We don't approach a client and ask them to pick services off a menu. We really try to tailor the styling process to the client, how they like to shop, how, you know, risk-taking they are as it relates to fashion, because the goal is obviously just to elevate and to parse out what their personal style is and find the best examples of that and and just continue to elevate on them. It's not really a paper doll process for me. I'm not just looking to dress somebody up. I really want to tap into what it is they're looking for and then lead them to something that they might not have been able to find on their own. So the process really starts out like getting to know them, getting getting to know their vendors, know what wedding planner they're working with, what photographer, what venue, what florist, because those are all indicators of their style off the bat. Somebody that's hiring a planner designer and working with a really gestural florist and custom making plates and really focused on a tablescape is a different client than somebody who is in you know a restaurant venue all about throwing an amazing party cares more about the music and the catering and is less focused on the design. So those are, you know, to me, automatically two different shoppers right off the bat. And then we try to figure out what the various events are, you know, from a welcome party, any theme parties, perhaps a brunch, um, how many times the client wants to change. And then I like to start with the wedding gown and orbit the rest of the wardrobe around it. And we typically do a lot of that remotely first, you know, showing clients photos, asking them questions. I'm, I'm not necessarily expecting a client to tell me what their wedding dress is, but they can very quickly tell me what it isn't. And so I usually start there, you know, most clients are like, I don't want a poofy dress, or I know I want a little bit of drama. And that leads me to questions like, how do you feel about sleeves? How do you feel about lace? And then we assemble an itinerary, a shopping itinerary that we do together, where we pull dresses in advance. Um, both in stores and in remote fittings that we arrange either in a client's home, in a hotel room, in a a rented space. Um, And we show them basically what we feel are the best dresses in the market. That usually leads us either to the dress, which we almost always customize. Every single one of our gowns is customized in one way or another, either with the brand by tweaking it ever so slightly or creating something fully custom. But that process sort of leads me to whether or not we're going to do a custom dress. And then it's about which design partner is the best fit for this client. And we might do another round of appointments to sort that out. But I sort of look at my job as as an editor. Um, It's my job to sort of edit down the best things in the market to present to the client at the right time. Um, Because the best ideas presented at the wrong time tend to get thrown out the window too. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 does it ever come to a point where you don't really feel like there's a good fit between you and a potential client? Like I hear planners talk about that and do- designers that sometimes, you know, as they start to get more in depth with a potential client, um, they don't necessarily feel like like they're going to be the best fit or going to get along well enough. Does that ever come up with you? Of course. I don't find issues with with like a personality fit very often. I'm I'm quite social. I'm quite adaptable. I love getting to know people. I very rarely have a client that I don't get along with in some way and that I, I can't find common ground with. But stylistically, I think there are moments where the client wants something that we just genuinely feel might not be in the best taste or it could be better. And I often use the phrase, even in front of clients, you know, that's not the hill I'm going to die on. Like if that's the dress that you're obsessed with, 
I'll, I'll lose that battle because where I'm about to stake my claim is in a bigger photo moment, like the rehearsal dinner. Like you want that brunch dress and it's not my favorite thing, not a problem. Let's talk about the rehearsal dinner because that's where I really feel we stand to make a stylistic impact because it's sort of the intro to the wedding weekend, both photographically and also for your guests. Because I do try to educate the client as well about how their clothing affects the guest experience too, um, and how it affects the overall look and feel of the day. And how does that affect the guest experience? I'm hearing more and more this year clients that don't want to make a big, they've hired a stylist, right? But they don't want to make a big deal. You know, we're not that fancy. It doesn't need to be that big of a deal. The the attire is come as you are. So I don't need to dress up so much. You're inviting people to an event. They're traveling, whether it's a short or a long distance. They've most likely spent money on a hotel room. If you know, you haven't hosted them or spent money on a gift for you or on a dress. They're so excited to celebrate with you. Um, They're expecting a bride. They're expecting a polished host. Um, It doesn't necessarily have to be in the package that they expect, but it should honor the fact that people have taken time out of their lives to come and celebrate with you. So, you know, showing up and seeing you, you know, not as polished or refined as you could be sort of sends a message that you didn't take it as seriously as perhaps they have. Um, And on top of that, I think fashion moments guide the event flow. Um, If a bride changes, it's a symbol to the guests. You know, if a bride walks into the room in a new change of clothes, it's a symbol to the guests in the room that there's more party to be had. Right. Um, it's why right. everyone cheers when the bride walks into the yeah. room. It's like, yeah, let's do this. And there's always like the music amps up and the lighting might change. And all of that stuff is architected through our, our close relationships with the planners, designers, and talents we get to work with. Yeah, absolutely. What about and in, in, digging into just for a moment, some real detail here, like about hair and makeup, you know, what, what, what do you feel are some of the, the do's and the don'ts when it comes to that? I find that I find a lot of people trying to cut back on budget with hair and makeup. It's such a worthwhile investment. We're incredibly lucky to get to refer a lot of that talent. And so we, we often have, you know, beyond skilled, incredible artists on our weddings. Um, There are a lot of moments where I see brides, leaning back on, you know, just images that they've seen on Pinterest interest, you know, images from their trial that might not have best suited them because to be fair, a hair and makeup trial is done in isolation of the garment. You're sitting alone in your apartment in a hotel room and in someone's studio showing them photos of your dresses. The neckline's not on you. The veil's not in the equation at, at that point. Um, and it's a little bit hard to architect glam three months, you know, anywhere from like three to 10 months before a wedding without any of the clothes being decided. So I typically just suggest that clients choose artists that they genuinely trust artists that are versatile, you know, people that can hair and makeup is the one thing you actually are able to change down to the last minute. So what happened in the trial, other than the client's comfort level is none of my concern. I mean, at the last minute, we might decide we want to change the hair from being up to down. Each look gets its own dedicated hair and makeup inspiration, whether it's carried over from the previous look to save time is one thing, but we really think about each look as its own individual moment. Um, And we want to have a balance of something being really elevated and really cool versus, you know, too many of those moments is try hard. So like if it's a super statement fashion moment, we tame back the hair and makeup. If it's really simple, maybe we bump it up and we work with the artists to make sure that, you know, they're comfortable that they get to show off what they can do. And also with the planners to make sure that we're not the stylist keeping our clients in a 20 minute hair and makeup change when they've only slotted five minutes. Oh, geez. Yeah. You know, also in terms of your offerings, don't you also bring um, art direction to it as well, if people want? Yeah. So my, my background is an art director, just from my time being at Martha Stewart and also my time being at Bazaar comes in naturally. I I think about clothing photographically. So when a client is trying on a gown or really any garment, you know, how does that garment move? Is it creating strange lines? Does she have to do a lot of work to get it to lay beautifully? Is this going to be something that we're 
chasing her around all day just to get it to look beautiful in photographs. And I tend to flag those in the process. And then on site, I really try to take time with the photographer to scout so that, you know, when they're finding an amazing space for a portrait of a gown, I'm able to say, well, this is a really small space. The gown is actually bigger than it looks in photos. Um, We might need a slightly larger space. What if we did a pre-wedding like rehearsal dinner shoot here, and then we moved the gown elsewhere or like even just accommodating for shoots the day before so that we can get really epic moments without messing up the flow of the timeline. It's just sort of a natural added value to our services. But I think it's something that separates CLG Creative and makes us unique because each one of us has that art direction skill set in one way or another. And I also am able to prop style the details. So whereas, you know, a lot of photographers are left to do flat lays on the day of a wedding, we can actually tag team those. I love collaborating on those with photographers and planners and anyone on the team that's excited about them. But I would hate to have a friend of mine who's a photographer and isn't a stylist like dreading setting up this shot and it's taking triple the amount of time when I could just, you know, help out a friend. You know, you're talking about behind all of this, for, I guess for all of us is really being of service, right? I mean, and I mean, great customer service has always been really important, but it seems to be getting more and more important every year. And especially now, you know, what would you advise overall to people in the industry about how we can take service to a whole nother level? How do you look at that? I mean, I, I speak about it internally with my team constantly. At Bazaar, I was lucky enough to not only get to cover fashion and weddings, but I also covered travel and the best run hotels anticipated the needs of the guest. And that's how we think about our services and how we approach clients. You know, we do everything for our clients up to placing orders for them, tracking those orders, handling their returns whenever we can, handling any transportation of garments. We think about looks from, you know, the foundation out. So our clients are never even bringing undergarments to their weddings. They're never having to worry about the cleaning of their garments after the fact, unless they want to, we handle that. We, you know, the gown shows up, you wear it, you enjoy it. The gown comes off. We then take it to have it cleaned and then it's shipped to you in a box and it can simply be placed in a closet. So it's that start, you know, that first impression down to the last impression that is incredibly important to us. And I think that there's, you know, a, a big, it's quite misguided to think that we're, we're, yes, we're talents. Yes, we're hired experts, but I like to think that I'm, you know, I'm both a respected expert. And also at the end of the day, I'm the help. You know, that's what I'm there for. I'm not one to be disrespected and I don't tolerate disrespect. And I've, gotten phenomenal advice um, from people like Mindy Weiss and Michelle Rago and Lenny Stin about commanding respect from the people that I work with. Right. But right. at the same time, I also think it's important to realize that it's a it's a privilege to be of service to somebody on a day when they would be lost without you. That's right. Yeah. So last question for this conversation, because you've been on many times, um, is that in terms of Uh, advising people in a bridal couple, do they need a stylist? You know, what kind of a stylist do they hire? And also for planners, you know, who are recommending to their couples whether or not they should have a stylist and what kind of a stylist to hire? How how would you advise? I mean, the short answer of do you need a stylist is, of course. Um, Yeah, I figure. Well, (laughs) and I think it was, this was years ago, um, Michaela Erlinger, who I know you've had on the show as well, who's a friend of mine, we were standing talking to each other and Marcy Bloom walked up to us and said, you know, just hold on because it used to be about, you know, should you hire a wedding planner? And now it's about what wedding planner do you hire? You guys are in the trenches of should I hire a stylist? And if you give your if you stay in it, it'll become which stylist do I hire? And I think we're close to that. I think each of us bring something unique to the process and to our client bases. And I definitely think we're a necessary service. It's just a question of, you know, how it best works for you and who pe- and who you feel as somebody that you can trust. At the end of the day, similar to a photographer and a hair and makeup artist, we're really there in the most intimate moments. So it has to be somebody that you get on with that you genuinely like and that you trust. I mean, in moments of high stress, you want to be able to look at that person next to you and trust that they have your best interest at heart. 
And so back to your like original question about client fit, I think that that's especially for planners looking to pair stylists with their clients. Like I'm all for answering those questions. I'm all for having preliminary conversations with planners to describe how we work. I'm all for doing that preliminary call with a client, whether it's one call, two calls, just to kind of make sure we're on the same page and that we're aligned about everything from how we work to how we charge to all the services on offer. Yeah, I think that's really important. Well, geez, Carrie, we covered a lot of ground in just a half hour. (laughs) This was amazing as usual. And I just I just wish you so well. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll touch base on the show periodically here. Want to hear how you're doing and and hear some good stories. So, uh, again, just fantastic. So happy for you. And uh, thanks for doing this again. Of course. Thanks for having me back. It's always fun. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Carrie Goldberg. Be sure to check out her website, which is carrielgoldberg.com. And you can find her on Instagram at Carrie Lauren. And be sure to check out the show notes in your cell phone's podcast app or at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And if you can think of three good friends who you feel would benefit from listening to Carrie's interview, please share it and also give it a review wherever you get your podcast from. Giving it a top rating and review really helps people find the show, and I appreciate that. So next week, our guest is going to be Jack Ezon, founder and managing partner of Embark Beyond, a luxury lifestyle partnership specializing in bespoke travel experiences. And finally, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so that you know when new episodes are dropped. And also follow us, particularly at Instagram, at The Wedding Biz. And we'll catch you next week.